Welcome back to the News Project on GNET TV. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director here at GNET TV's News Project, and once again, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. We're continuing with our series of interviews with the leading candidates for Vermont's governorship. Uh, and today it's our pleasure to have with us in our virtual studio, Rebecca Holcomb, who is uh, the former Secretary of Education. She served in that office from 2014 to 2018 and is one of the candidates seeking the Democratic Party's nomination for uh, the governorship. We had a chance to speak with Ms. Holcomb uh, earlier today. Ms. Holcomb has been uh, an educator for many years, first as a teacher, a principal, and a school administrator. She was also the director of Dartmouth's uh, teacher, teacher education program from 2011 to 2014. We had a wide-ranging discussion with her about not only education issues, but others that are confronting the state. Hello, Secretary Holcomb. Thank you very much for uh, being with us today and welcome to the News Project. Thank you, Andrew. It's a thrill to be here. Uh, well, okay, uh, lots to talk about and uh, really wanna hear your, uh, your views and some of the main issues that are facing the state. But uh, just to get us started, uh, I guess the obvious question is, uh, what prompted you to run? I know you considered a, a run in 2018, if I recall correctly, but uh, opted not to at that time, but uh, uh, I guess it was last year you announced that you'd be a candidate this, for this year's election. Uh, what prompted your decision on that? Right, I, I didn't run in, in 2018, but you know, I've worked in, in Vermont a long time. And let me just tell you about one person I met uh, because I think it helps you understand why I'm running. And she's a mom. She's a mom who works full time as a home health aide taking care of other people. And she takes care of her son. She spoke to me because she's working full time and is struggling to earn enough to pay her rent, keep her family fed. She just took in the child of her sister because her sister is struggling with addiction and needs help caring for her child at this moment while she gets treatment. And this mother was concerned concerned because she just found out that her water might have been contaminated by a nearby business. And as she looked at me, she just started tearing up and she said she because she can't make ends meet and that's the story of so many vermonters and that woman really sticks with me because far too many vermonters are doing everything they're supposed to do they're caring for all of us they're working really hard and we aren't taking care of them and so for me running for governor is is making sure that everybody in this great state no matter where they live and who they are has the support they need when bad things happen and the opportunity they need to go out and get a good job that pays a living wage and lets them live well and deliver on the promise of this great state. And that's why I'm running for governor, because the same issues that motivated me to run in the first place, they've now become crises. We have a healthcare crisis. We have an environmental crisis. We have an economic crisis. And we have a crisis of social justice and racism at the same time. And that's because COVID-19 has just sort of laid bare some of the challenges we have across the state in ways that we can't turn away anymore. We see that if we don't have real solutions to these problems, there really isn't the bright future that our children deserve. And I start by saying that because for me, you know, Governor Scott's done a solid job of managing the crisis. He's done a great job of listening to the Department of Health and being very measured in how we respond to COVID in ways that keep people safe. But solving a crisis is like running around your house in the middle of a rainstorm, shoving buckets under the holes in your roof, catching the water, coming through the ceiling. What we need is a governor who can plan for the future, who knows we need a new roof and a new foundation so we're not solving crises all the time. And that's why as governor, I'm going to work hard on health care and make sure that we finish the payment reform so that in the middle of health crises, like right now, uh, people get the care they need and our, and our primary care docs and our hospitals aren't going bankrupt. I'm going to turn into issues like broadband and make sure that we, we get it done because if we don't have 21st century technology and we don't have a 21st century economy, we actually don't have much of a future for the small businesses in our state. And we're going to be continuing to spend billions of dollars out of state on fossil fuels when we could be building wealth and building opportunity right here at home. You know, and, and as Secretary of Education, I worked hard on issues around uh, equity because I know that we don't give every Vermonter a fair chance to learn and 
become strong and healthy and go out and create prosperity, we all lose. And so I'll turn into that issue as well because we need to make sure everybody has no barriers between their hopes and dreams and, uh, and, the, and the opportunities to realize them. So those are the kinds of issues I'll be leaning into. Okay, well, uh, let's talk about education first then, since that obviously is a big part of your background. Uh, you served as the education secretary for four years from 2014 to 2018. You oversaw the implementation of Act 46, a very controversial measure uh, at the time and, and continues to be, sort of. And one of the other issues that always seems to bubble up is the cost of education in Vermont. Uh, right, now, right now, currently, uh, if I remember correctly, the state education uh, fund is about $160 million short. Some of that may be backfilled by federal dollars coming in either from the CARES Act or from another source. But uh, if that doesn't happen, then we have a rather dire situation on our hands. I guess, uh, what, do, what, in your opinion, does the state need to do to either stabilize or control its spending on ed education? Mm -hmm. So there's there's so many questions in what you did. We could talk. You know, Andrew, because you yeah. know I love this topic. We could talk for hours. But I think that I so think you're good. right. We have a, a huge challenge around um, around affordability. And one of the things I was taught in business school is if you want to know what's driving your cost, you go back and actually look at what's making your costs increase because that's the only way to get handle of it. The this whole issue about the education fund coming short, coming you know high. This is sort of an artifact of a decision that we made several years ago to replace a general fund transfer with with you know the sales and uh, the room and meals taxes so it, it's you know the issue is we can't afford it because we're moving into a recession and everybody's tight right now if we're going to try to make it better we have to look at what's driving up cost and there are a couple things that are driving up cost one of them was the issue of declining enrollments and we know that if you're trying to maintain the same program offer the same opportunities to kids with the same staff in the same building, but you have fewer and fewer kids, the cost of you know, of you of raising the taxes to fund them in our shared education system is going to go up and you'll be paying more in taxes. How you solve that problem is different in different communities. Some of the most exciting work I've seen is school boards who are saying, hey, our problem is not enough kids in our building. How do we get more kids in our building? And they're partnering with child cares, for example, to bring in more kids. And in fact, Whiting, the town of Whiting, which was the town behind our education funding formula, uh, last year had about 35 kids in the building. This year they've got 70 because they partnered with the child care to fill their building back up. And when you walk in, you, you open the first door and there's a room full of babies. And this is the kind of way that we can get more value out of every dollar we spend by making sure that we're working together across sectors to squeeze every ounce of value out of these buildings and these assets we already own. So that's one opportunity to think better about how we organize and use our facilities so we do more for taxpayers. Another way to create opportunity is to say, hey, what's driving up our bills? You know, this year in the terms of the increase in our education costs, a third of that is healthcare. And we have a governor who has not talked about healthcare until he mentioned it in the state of the state and haven't heard a word since. The problem is school boards cannot control the cost of their health care increases right now because this is now negotiated at the state level. That was taken out of the school, local school responsibilities by the governor. And if we're going to solve that cost of health care, we need a governor who is going to lead and roll up their sleeves and get to work on bringing down the cost of health care statewide. Another big driver of increased cost in our education fund is mental health services, what we call pupil support services because our population isn't just older and it isn't just smaller, it's more economically challenged and our schools are dealing with the face of the opiate epidemic and some of the growing disadvantage in the state. And that's showing up in school budgets in terms of increased mental services, support services for kids. But here's the problem. When the state doesn't fund mental health for families, Kids come into school and they need help and schools pay to help those kids, but then they send them home to families that still aren't getting help. And then they have to start all over again the next day. So what we need to do is think through what it is that our state system is supposed to do, 
make sure it has the funding appropriate to do that so that families can take care of their kids and that cost doesn't just get shoved into the ed fund where it's really harder to solve the core problem of making sure families are okay. So those are just a couple of examples of how I would approach the issue of affordability and there are others as well. But, um, but my point is we're gonna have to think differently. And if there is a lesson about COVID, it's that we can't go back to where we were before because where we were before wasn't working. So we need to be thinking aggressively across all sectors about how we do differently so we can have strong schools at the heart of every community, good opportunities for early care and learning so kids whose parents have to work have good safe places with caring adults who take care of them and frankly at the college level to make sure that people whether adults or kids leaving our high schools have opportunities to get the skills they need to get good jobs that pay far above minimum wage so that they can be part of creating the bright prosperous future for our state well i want to ask you uh, about the state colleges uh, as you know they've been in the news a bit lately uh, mm -hmm. Former Chancellor Jeb Spaulding uh, floated a proposal that was, uh, well, <laughs> not, not well received, I guess would be one way of putting it. Um, but uh, I've often wondered if he uh, might have had a point with that proposal that, uh, you know, the, the realities of uh, some of our state colleges is such that, you know, between the uh, student uh, enrollment count and uh, the costs uh, associated with running them, that uh, a radical rethink of, of how we do them uh, may be in order, but what do you think uh, should be the, pro the proper fix for the, the situation that schools like NVU and Castleton and, and uh, Vermont Technical College have? Uh, how do we, is it gonna just involve like uh, putting in uh, lots of money just to keep them afloat until times change or, or is there another way to go? So I, I'm glad you brought this up and I, I just want to acknowledge I know how hard it's been because I've heard repeatedly how hard it's been in the southern tier of the state to lose our colleges. We've lost you know, three in the recent years in the southern part of the state. And I think it points up how important actually our institutions of advanced learning are to the state. You know, they provide economic stability to the communities where they are. They are the opportunity for Vermonters. And when you look at who the state colleges serve, I think something like 85 or 90 percent of their students are actually Vermonters, many of them the first generation in their family to go to college, and many of them are going part-time because they may be working while they go to school, and so they need to have the flexibility and they need to have a college near them so that they can do that while they're still going to school and working. Um, and and it, you know, so it's, these colleges serve a really important role in Vermont in terms of ensuring that we actually have a future, particularly in the counties outside Chittenden County. That's an important thing to recommend. So I, I didn't talk to Jeb Spaulding, but anyone who says that this wasn't coming wasn't paying attention because the, the, the writing has been on the wall for years. And you, know, you mentioned the fact that our schools have lost a lot of population and that's created some unique challenges. Well, our public schools are actually the feeder system for our state college system. So the, the shrinking population of our schools is hitting our colleges as well. And they have 10 or so more years of this to cope with um, because those, those declines are still in our school system and they haven't been fully um, reached yet by our, our college system. So I say that as a way of saying that on the first hand, we cannot give up on state, our state college system, and we cannot have a bright future unless we figure out how to maintain a vibrant state college system with a footprint in our different counties outside Chittenden County. And at the same time, it needs to be maybe a little different, and it needs to respond to the specific needs of our Vermonters who are using these colleges, and it needs to maybe rethink how we use all of our state facilities across the state in ways where we work together, maybe tighten the partnership with our public school system to make it easier to transition in and um, make better use of the facilities we have so that we can focus our dollars on our teaching staff, which is where we get the most value for our students in Vermont. I put out a set of recommendations. I encourage anyone who's interested to go to the website um, and look at it, rebeccaholcomb.com. If you scroll down the news, you can see some of the initial recommendations I put forward that would have reduced the cost on overhead and, and encouraged and supported more collaboration across the VTC, the CCV, which has been very successful, and also Northern Vermont University, 
and Castleton in ways that ensure that we still have those institutions, but maybe with a slight rethinking of how we use all of our, our shared physical assets to get more value for Vermonters. Um, and I encourage people to look at it, but we have no future without that. Yeah, as you say, a, a lot of, a lot of, for a lot of folks, that is, uh, that is the, the entry point into a college. They, they couldn't, it's not an option for them to go to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or, or even perhaps even UVM, but this is an opportunity for them to get a college education, often, as you said, the first members of their family to, to go to school. Go and to, it's not just that, Andrew. I mean, it's also critical to the Vermont economy. I mean, we have a critical shortage, for example, of nurses right now in this state. And it's even more important in the time of COVID when we know we need enough uh, healthcare professionals to respond to pretty acute healthcare needs in different parts, particularly as we reopen. And I spent a lot of time looking through hospital budgets last summer when people were presenting before the Green Mountain Care Board. And our hospitals are all hiring what we call traveling nurses. They're really temporary nurses that we, we bring in from out of state that cost two to three times what it costs to hire hire a Vermont nurse locally. And the reason we're hiring them is we don't have enough nurses. At the same time, our career and tech centers, including some in your area, are training high school students who want to go into the health professions. Um, many of them are graduating high school with an LNA, and some of them have got almost two years of community college credit through dual enrollment and fast forward, some of the other exciting programs that we have in our Vermont high schools. And um, you, you know, why not pay those students to go all the way to an RN so that when they are done, they can take one of those jobs in our hospital system or in our primary care practices, which would save money for all of us. So it's, it's, we're thinking too small about saving money. And we need to understand when we allow Vermonters to get those credentials, to become nurses, they actually save money for all of us, even when we've invested in their, in their degrees. And the, there's no institution like our state college system to get that work done. Well, as you said, we could probably talk about the education issues for probably a couple of hours, but I, I'd like to pivot at this point uh, uh, to another issue that has emerged uh, rather dramatically in the last month or so. And I'm referring, of course, to the whole Black Lives Matter movement and uh, the, uh, so the ancillary discussion that's emerged around defunding police departments. I'm not sure, I, I think when people say defunding police departments, they're not always on the same page as to what that actually means. But I guess I, I'm just curious, what is, what is your takeaway about how police departments should perhaps uh, analyze themselves or re-examine their roles? Uh, and, and should that, those roles be somehow different perhaps than what we've typically thought of what they should be. Uh, I mean, I was talking to somebody uh, last week who said, well, when I say defunding, it means taking the money that police officers currently need now to be sort of more like social workers uh, to handle a whole wide range of problems that have really nothing to do with, you know, uh, a criminal act, but it's more social problems and social workers could, could do that, but they don't have the money in their budgets to, to train enough people. So I guess, uh, what, I guess to get back to my main question, uh, what is your feeling about all of that? Uh, should police departments be restructured, reimagined, defunded, or, or what? Right, and I think, I think you've said there's a lot there, and, and you know, you've asked questions both about where our funding priorities are, and I'll address that first, and then secondly, within law enforcement, what are, the, what are some of the guidelines that we want, might want to follow moving forward? With respect to the first one, we have been systematically disinvesting in safety nets and supports for families that help them be successful, get back on their feet when terrible things happen, and go on and become, uh, you know, participating community members in our in our different communities across Vermont. So I think we have a real need to start repurposing our dollars into mental health supports for families so that people get treatment and don't end up in the justice system because they haven't gotten the health care that they need, the mental health care they need. We need to start investing heavily in supporting uh, treatment for addiction because addiction is a disease. And if we give people the medical treatment for a disease and provide the support for recovery, they can re-enter our communities and be full participating members of our community. And that reduces the need for, for you know, members 
in the law enforcement community, but it also makes sure that we're treating the problem with the right tool. And police officers are not trained to provide mental health support. They are not trained to provide a, a treatment for addiction. And the best place to get treatment for mental health or addiction needs isn't in jail. It's in a, a, a place or a setting that specializes in treatment. So I think when we invest aggressively in creating economic uh, opportunities so people can earn and live well and take care of their families, when we provide appropriate community supports that make sure that when people need help, they get help, we don't have the need for the extensive investments in, in criminal justice. And it, it may take um, a couple years, but we need to make sure that this time we actually do the work of shifting that investment towards, um, towards making sure people are healthy and well. And secondly, you talked about this issue of our criminal justice system. And I think there is growing consensus, even within the law enforcement community, that we may need some changes. We may need some new practices um, that address pretty clear and consistent effort of particularly racial bias, but also some concerns around bias against individuals with disabilities or individuals who are economically disadvantaged in our, in our criminal justice system more broadly. We need to make that change because we are not the land of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for all when, frankly, there are barriers based on race um, or bias that prevent some people from feeling safe. Public safety should make our community members feel safe and it should be responsive to the communities we serve. So, you know, I think we will see some, some legislation and action on appropriate use of force. I think we need to pay hard attention to hiring, training, and promotion uh, practices in law enforcement. I think we need to pay um, attention to community uh, review boards or boards that are providing oversight that represent the communities being served so that the input to those law enforcement entities reflects the needs of the communities that they serve. And um, we also need to, frankly, though, make sure that there's accountability. And one of the things that will do more than anything to breed resentment or distrust is if there is a community review panel and it reports or recommends changes to practice to address what we see as disproportionality and nothing happens. So we need to make sure that there's a way to actually ensure that any recommendations are actually followed through on. And frankly, if we see, for example, excessive use of force, that we don't fund it from the state, that there's some ability to withhold funds if practices are really out of line consistently. And to do that, we need better data. And it's not enough to connect um, just law enforcement stops, you know, traffic stops, because one of the things that we've seen is uh, testimony after testimony about how it's about any contact with law enforcement, and that's where we need to go. So we need to be collecting better data so we can actually evaluate in a robust way where the challenges are, and then do the hard work of holding ourselves accountable to make the difference that, that frankly, our communities of color really deserve and really need. We have to earn the trust because the state has a long history of behaving in ways that have made some people distrustful. But I think that kind of open review, that kind of partnerships with communities, particularly communities that have felt um, marginalized, that's how we're gonna rebuild that trust and make sure that these institutions serve the public and are responsive to the concerns of public safety. Jumping over to another question that was a, seemed like a very big deal in Montpelier back in January before everything changed, uh, where, where's the, the family leave and minimum wage questions. Um, when, when last I checked, uh, the governor had vetoed uh, the family leave bill and the Senate, uh, the, the state house wasn't able to overturn that veto by I think it was a one vote margin. Um, if you were elected governor, uh, what would your approach to family leave be? Uh, would you want to see that uh, implemented uh, in some way? Or would you be supporting the legislation that was vetoed? Or, or would you like to see something else? Absolutely, we'd be pushing that bill because we see more than ever in the middle of COVID-19 how important it is. And when you look at who is more likely to have paid leave in the state of Vermont, tends to be higher earners. They tend to use it more for, um, for things that aren't medically related. And the people who don't have it are those who are the ones, frankly, who are on the front lines right now uh, taking care of us, whether they're working as, you know, 
cashiers in our grocery stores or whether they're some of our home health providers or some of our medical professionals. We need to make sure that when, especially in a pandemic, when people need to be taking care of their families, they can do so without losing wages. I think of that mother I mentioned right at the beginning. She can't afford to take time off to take care of her kid and keep him healthy because if she does, then she loses wages and she can't afford to feed him. This is the kind of terrible trade-off that no Vermonter should be struck, stuck in right now. And so we have to do this. And I think COVID-19 has underscored how important this is for people. And at the same time, we know that um, you know, in many parts of the state, if you have two parents working full-time at minimum wage jobs, we know they can't afford to pay their rent because that isn't enough to cover your rent in many of our housing markets. This is going to become even more problematic. I've spoken to several several people today who mentioned that they have seen out-of-staters come in and buy houses sight unseen, literally off the internet. Um, you know, this is going to create acute pressures on housing in a state that already has an acute shortage of affordable housing. When you talk about particularly our workers who are earning between 40, 45, and $70,000 a year, we are creating a situation where no matter how hard they work, they can't afford um, to, to pay and take care of their families. And, and that's a real problem. So we need to look at raising the minimum wage, but we also need to make sure that we're making sure that we're creating new economic opportunities in high wage sectors. Things like green energy, our green energy economy sector, where people can frankly walk out of high school if they've got the right credential and earn far above minimum wage right out of the job. I mentioned nurses earlier. We know that if we can help Vermonters go and get those credentials in, in the health and medical professions, they can earn far above minimum wage with the right credential. We also see it in, um, in some of our light manufacturing, advanced manufacturing and green construction. These are high wage, high growth sectors where there's huge opportunity to get not minimum wage, but far above minimum wage. And that's why we need to turn into education and our state college system and making sure every Vermonter, whether there's someone looking to retool or some young person looking to get into the job market has an opportunity to pursue those jobs. So those are the kinds of things I'll work on. I think we have time for about one more question. Um, and there's several I've been trying to think, okay, which is the most important one here, but there's one that I, I keep coming back to, um, uh, and that's the whole question of overhauling Act 250. Uh, you know, you were just talking a moment ago about the green economy and whatnot. Or, uh, that's been under discussion at the legislature, as you know, for several years now. And uh, uh, lawmakers seem to be unable to come up with a, a compromise that everybody can sort of sign off on. Uh, if you're elected governor, what would you be pushing for uh, in this revision of Act 250 that's been discussed? I mean, the Act is now, what, 50 years old. Uh, it's been a hugely important part of Vermont's uh, history over the past five decades. Um, but uh, as with everything else, it's 50 years old. It probably needs a little work. Um, what would you like to see incorporated into that bill, um, if anything? And maybe you think it's fine just the way it is. No, I think I, I think I agree with many of the people who feel that you know we we are so lucky to have had Act 250. It's part of what's created our green working landscape, and and maintained the 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 feel of Vermont that I think so many people cite as the reason they love to live here. But I think we see very clearly we need to find ways to support uh, expansion of climate friendly affordable housing in walkable downtowns. This is what I hear from young person after young person after young person. They don't want to be living in cars all the time. They want to live near where they work. And they, to do that, we need to find ways to support development of affordable housing that meets pre-approved guidelines in our walkable downtown. So people can live near work, we can concentrate our development so it isn't spread out all over our beautiful landscape because that the, protects the integrity of our forests and we need to protect the integrity of our continuous forests and protect our working lands. That's part of our climate friendly nature, but it's also frankly part of our food security in the future. So I see this, this round of revision about, of Act 250 as an opportunity opportunity to protect the environmental goals of the state while ensuring and supporting growth of higher density carbon friendly housing in our walkable downtowns. 
Okay, well, I guess we're going to have to leave it there for today, uh, which is unfortunate. This will be, I think, I think we should probably have another conversation at some point. Down I would our- love it, Andrew. I always appreciate my conversations. You always ask things that make me think, and maybe we can do a physically distant chat someday down right. there. That would be great. I'm looking forward to the time when we can be back in our studio as opposed to the virtual studio uh, <laughs> and uh, have to do it the old-fashioned way. Yeah. But anyway, I guess a lot to do for now. But uh, Secretary Holcomb, thank you very much again for your for your time today and, and being willing to talk with us. Uh, and good luck out there on the campaign trail. Thank I- you much. I look forward to seeing you down the road. All right. Me too. All right. Take care. Take care.